So I think you, I guess you received the, the paper I gave, which is uh, the paper in French, and another paper, older paper, which was already published uh, in the International Journal of Political Economy. And this one is in English. So actually, <coughs> I'm working with another economic whose name is Dominique Levy. And now we are working, or we have been working for since uh, maybe four or five years on a book on macroeconomics, which is a mathematical book. And uh, we have t already two books published by Harvard University Press. And we, had a s we have a third contract uh, for a big book on macroeconomics, 500 pages, 100 figures. And we have been working for five years. And we are starting over now. So it will take more years just to give you the context. So after, but during these years, we kept working on other aspects. In our work, there is a, a Marxist, a Marxian uh, basis inspiration, because I was a student in the 1960s. <laughs> and uh, I published a lot on, uh, on Marx. And uh, my interest is also on philosophy. It's also on history. And so after so many years on models of macroeconomic models, I was fed up. And I decided to, to stop during six months and write another book for change. Uh, um, actually, two or three years ago, we published another book in French, which is called La Grande Bifurcation. It has been translated in uh, various languages, in Latin America in particular, Spanish and Portuguese, but not in English so far. But actually, the new book is, in a sense, related to this earlier book. So <coughs> during the last six months, uh, I work on a new book uh, whose title is uh, Managerial Capitalism. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> this book will be, you can already buy it on Amazon. And it's supposed to be published on March uh, 20. Okay. So now it's going through the printing process. It's really a forthcoming book, okay? It's not a project for... And uh, <clears throat> the title, Managerial Capitalism, is not a good title uh, because this is the title that the publisher really wanted. Uh, and my project was to call it Managerialism. But they saw that it was not good, so uh, we accepted to have Managerial Capitalism. Alors, in France, people do not know what managerial capitalism is about. Okay. In the US, yes, to some extent, because the phrase is used, managerial capitalism. And as you know, managerial, in the phrase managerial capitalism, has to do with managers. Okay. In French, I don't know how many people can speak French in this room. In French, it's called un cadre. Uh, uh, this is a concept which exists in French and doesn't really exist in English, but translation of manager is cadre in French. And uh, the difficulty there is that in the, the concept of managers uh, is more, uh, a cons its use is restricted to, let's say, firms, okay, management of private firms. It's used in many contexts, of course. But in the expression managerial capitalism, uh, the notion of manager behind the word managerial is really the managers of private corporations. But actually, uh, in contemporary societies, you also have people, uh, let's say, senior officials, okay? People working in government institutions or within international institutions. And these people can be also called managers, but in an extended sense to the kind of a state, you know, sector, public sector. So this 
why the notion, as I said, you know, there is a huge literature in English uh, and in the US in particular about managerial capitalism. So the idea is that capitalism is transforming itself. Okay? Capitalism, in Marx, terminology is a mode of production. Okay? When did capitalism begin? It's a difficult question. For example, in French, we have the concept of uh, ancien régime, okay, old régime, which is a period of about two, two centuries, because to exactly two centuries, in the, the way the historian you know, used the concept of ancien régime, up to the French Revolution, 1789, as you know. And uh, uh, two centuries with the famous kings, Louis XIV, 15, 16, and so on. And so it's a period of transition. It's a period of transition in which um, capitalist relations of production are developing, but it's not really capitalism. Okay? It's the emergence of capitalist relations of production. And uh, obviously, similar development occurred in England. Uh, even, as you know, the Industrial Revolution, in a sense, occurred earlier in England. Uh, so there is an in English Ancien Régime, although the phrase uh, Ancien Régime is not generally used in the context of England, but very similar evolution uh, occurred in England. As you know, the Industrial Revolution, which is not capitalism, it's an one aspect of the development of capitalism, is generally dated from the uh, late uh, 18th century to uh, 1930, something like that in England. But historians do not agree on the period of the Industrial Revolution in England, and they don't even agree on the fact that there was an Industrial Revolution. If you read various authors, it's not, it's not clear. Similar development happened in France, probably lagging behind to some extent. Okay. But, you know, very similar de development happened. And then you have the United States, uh, you know the story. I just recall that there was something like a revolution in the sense of the bourgeois revolution in France in uh, the late 18th century. The difference is that the revolution in England occurred uh, around 17, 16, sorry, 1640, which is the first half of the 17th century. You know the story? Two civil wars or one civil war, the Cromwell, you know, and everything. Okay. So the, if we speak of the development of capitalism, we are Mm. We have to confront this type of uh, difficulty that it's difficult to find dates, you know, when things happen or if they happen. Why do I speak of uh, this period? Because this is the development of capitalist relations of production. And when we arrive in the 19th, the 19th century, well, this begins to look like capitalism. And as you know, Marx, well, moved from what is today Germany to Paris in 1840. And this is the period Marx was born, I recall, in 1880. And this will be the 200th anniversary of his birth in May this year. And so when he arrived in Paris, he's a young man, yeah, 20, 25 years, and actually he begins to discover what capitalism is about. Also, you know, he begins to discover what socialism or communism is about, because Marx did not invent at all communism or uh, socialism. These are ideas which were developing, but things are still not very clear, actually, when Marx arrived in Paris in around uh, in uh, 1840 uh, with Engels and they begin to work on the new relations of production. 
So these new relations of production have been developing historically maybe during two centuries. Or it's impossible to find the beginning you know, of the story. And, uh, but, you know, the Ancien Regime, we are no longer in the Middle Ages. We are no longer in feudalism. Although many aspects of feudal society are still existing. I insist on this one because we are speaking of the transition between what Marx co called the transition between two modes of production. One mode of production, feudalism. The next mode of production, capitalism. One mode of production, one class structure, pattern. But our thesis is, our interpretation of history is that capitalism now is transforming itself into a new mode of production, new mode of production, managerialism. We are still in capitalism, but new relations of production are emerging and giving birth to new, a new mode of production that we call managerialism. And so you can see that in our understanding of contemporary development, history is very important, but you have, in a sense, a fundamentalist Marxist or Marxian viewpoint in the sense that we refer to modes of production, class patterns, and everything, because it's impossible to understand what's going on now, you know, without reference to relations of production to class patterns, completely impossible. But, you know, there is also a revisionist aspect because we think that it's impossible to stop where Marx stopped, okay? Because we are into new relations of production are now developing as we call managerialism. But you see, one mode of production, one class pattern, okay? And so the ruling class or the upper class in capitalism was the capitalist class and lower class, proletarian class, if you want, the workers, okay? In managerialism, we have a new situation. The new ruling class is the class of managers and the new rule class are the people who are managed by the managers. There is no name for that, okay? Managed people. And so what I will try to show, and that we will discuss, is why we develop this type of framework, okay? Why, on what basis we develop this type of framework, and I hope I will be able to show how it is important to understand contemporary developments, okay? Alors, the book, this is a blank page, okay? And uh, the next slide here is the title of the book, Managerial capitalism means neither cap pure capitalism nor pure managerialism, okay? We are now in a kind of hybrid society with capitalist aspects which are surviving and new managerial aspects which are developing, okay? This is what can be called an hybrid social formation. And the subtitle is supposed to be more explicit, and here you have ownership. Ownership means the ownership of the means of production, capital, if you want, and uh, management. This is what managers are supposed to do, to manage, but also to organize a government institution, as I said before, and the coming new mode of production. Well, this is the idea of a new mode of production substituting itself for capitalism, okay? So, this is the topic of the book. In our long life of researchers, we publish a lot of books on this type of issues. The first book, book I published on my own in my life was in uh, 1975, okay? And uh, it was about managers. It was about managers, but using Marxist capitalist, ca uh, capital, the book, the capital, because actually Marx 
the, had no idea that a new mode of production could appear. He had some idea at some point. But Marx devoted a lot of research and pages in the volume three of Capital to managers. And so, well, I will speak a little bit of the book and then I will turn to the uh, actual content. Uh, yeah. Well, this is the outline of the book because it's almost finished. In the book, you have four parts. Why? I want to, to show you what is our project, what we want to do, okay? And then I will enter technically into the matter. And so there is a first part in the book, and the first part is about uh, Marx's an analysis of history. It's not so much. In Marx, you have two theoretical frameworks. One is the analysis of history, and uh, the other one is the analysis of the economy, okay, political economy. Because the capital, the book, Marx's book, it's a book about political economy. It's not only a book about the criticism of political economy, as in the subtitle, but it's a, a book about political economy. What is the difference? The difference is, if you study political economy, the basic notions are capital, commodity, value, profits. You study the tendencies of technical change, okay? This is political economy. Now, the theory of history is something else. The theory of history is human society developed through various phases, historical phases, which are called modes of production. Each, to each mode of production, you can associate a class pattern, okay, with an upper class, a lower class. And of course, as I s explained before, modes of production overlap, and they overlap a lot, okay? So it's difficult uh, often to understand exactly what's going on because new relations are developing while old relations are still there. And in Marx terminology, Marxist terminology, Marx has this notion of productive forces and relations of production. Productive, it's difficult to define, but productive forces means the capability human beings have acquired to produce with organization, with technology, and so on. And relations of production means that human being groups, which are actually classes, have distinct position vis-a-vis -vis the means of production. For example, in capitalism, Capitalist owner, but they own capital, which means that they own firms, they own machines and buildings and so on, and they hire the workers. So they are in a certain position vis a vis the means of production. Workers themselves are in an other position because they don't own the means of production. So they can no longer be independent workers because they don't have the money to buy the new technology and so on. So they need to sell their, uh, <coughs> their work or their workforce, as Marxist, Marx puts it, okay? So pe various groups of people have distinct positions. We will discuss, obviously, the position of managers vis-a-vis -vis the, vis -vis the means of production. So this is Marx's theory of history. It's very sophisticated, okay? Very, very sophisticated. But you need to distinguish between the, the theory of history and political economy. Of course, it's linked because the political economy Marx developed is the political economy of capitalism, which is one phase in the history, in the, the, the theory of history that I just recalled. Of course, there should be a theory, a political economy of feudalism. And, but Marx and Engels did not develop very much this uh, type of analysis. And of course, there should be a theory of managerialism according to our interpretation, because managerialism is a new mode of production. The difficulty is that managerialism is developing very fast now, okay? so we are in managerial capitalism, but we don't have in front of us 
some kind of uh, developed managerialism. So it's constantly blended with, with capitalist relations. So it's very difficult to understand exactly what is going on. So the first part of the book is Marxist theory of history. So as you can see, but first we begin with empirics. And I will show you the empirics in a while, okay? Because the empirics are extremely important. In our works, we do mathematics, we do a lot of empirics, we measure everything, and we also do theory, huh? which can be macroeconomic theory of theory or history or anything. And so uh, I will show at the beginning part of the empirics. Then you have a chapter which is Marx's theory of history, and another chapter which is Marx saw that a new group was developing that he called managers like everybody, because in the 19th century, manager were, oh, managers were already playing an important role. And to Marx, it was a problem. Why was it a problem? Because he had a two-class structure in mind, capitalist owner of the means of production and workers. So suddenly, he sees managers. Managers, they are not workers. They, they, for example, within firms, they organize production, okay? They do what the capitalist himself should do, but he's no longer doing because the firm is too large. Oh, he's lazy, eh? Oh, she is lazy. Eh? So, so Marx is concerned with the problem of manager, but he cannot solve really the problem of manager. So, you know, now, chapter five is more difficult in the sense that we believe that in Marx's analysis of history, you have two aspects. Marx, of course, is a theoretician of class society and classes. So there is a first historical dynamic, which is a dynamic of class society with class struggles and so on. And of course, but there is another aspect, which Marxists usually do not consider, that we call sociality. Because Marx and Engels had the view that humanity is going through a process of, let's say, simply organization. Uh, the economy, but social relations are constantly developing, becoming more complex. It's very simple if you consider the economy. You have larger firms. You have a network of firms within one country and between various countries. Okay? And so, but also the state, you know, the state is gradually playing a more and more important role. We are in an organized society now. Does that mean that it's good? Okay? But, you know, it is organized in a certain sense. So you always, and in Marx and Engels' views, this was very important because they believed that socialism or communism, in a sense, would push much further the social organization. Their view of socialism was socialism will, capitalism is still disorder. Socialism will be a very well organized society with a planning, for example, huh? but everything will be well organized. So in Marx and Engels, you always have two aspects. One is very explicit, it is a class aspect. Okay, through the various modes of production, you have distinct class patterns, ruling classes, and lower classes, and so on. But also, there is a process of organization, gradual organization, and there is a little bit of, or a lot maybe, of Hegel, the philosopher, you know, in this uh, view that Marx and Engels had about the gradual organization of society. So chapter six is to explain what is managerialism as a new mode of production and a, what is managerial capitalism, this hybrid social formation, on the one hand capitalist, on the other hand uh, managerial. And chapter seven is to be nice or bad with uh, other people we, who studied, you know, managers. So it means that there is a huge literature, no, not in France, you know, but 
in the US, but not all uh, in England. And also, there was a very important literature in which is related to the development of what we call self-proclaimed socialism. Self-proclaimed socialism is what people call real socialism, generally meaning it's uh, fake. Okay? So, so we prefer to, to call it self-proclaimed socialism because a number of countries, like in Russia, decided that they were building socialism. Okay? And so, in this context, there is a huge literature about the problem of managers, and I will return to that, or maybe in the discussion, and we will return to that. Why? Why? Because who was controlling a country like USSR? A new class of managers. Okay? And of course, you know, when the revolution occurred in Russia, Many people were very concerned about that, and even much before, when Marx created, or well, he did not create, but he, he contributed to the first international in uh, 1864, okay, he was criticized by anarchists, by Bukharin, saying what you want to do is to <coughs> give all power to a new class, of organizers, that is a new class of managers. So all these debates were very important, even when Marx was alive, okay, alive. And so there is a very big literature on the problem of managers. <coughs> so this is the object of chapter seven. <coughs> it, and chapter eight, which is the last of the first part, is the problem of the overlapping. The problem of if you, here we begin with the Middle Ages and we study a little bit what feudalism was about. We study the emergence of capitalist relations of production. We study the Ancien Regime, in particular in France and in England, as I said before. And we show how difficult it is to interpret the emergence of new relations of production in the context of uh, hybrid uh, social relation. And we explained that this lasted more than two centuries. Why is it important? It's important to us because our view is that something similar, analytically, obviously, because the contents are different, something similar is happening in our society. So this is a long chapter about history to explain what the transition between two modes of production is about. The following part is entitled 12 Decades of Managerial Capitalism. And this is a study of managerial capitalism since, let's say, the beginning of the uh, 20th century or since World War I. Okay? And so I will present aspects of this. Uh, here we show how. The fact of interpreting the transformation of social relations in terms of the emergence of new relations of production allows for the interpretation of contemporary society, contemporary social relations. Okay. So because the characteristic, the characteristic feature of contemporary society is that you have three fundamental classes. One class is a class of capitalists, the other class is a class of manager, and the third one, third one is a class of worker. But worker in a broad sense, because it's on, not only worker in the factory, but this is other type of employees uh, that you know now. So it's absolutely crucial to understand the economy and to understand social relation, to accept the view that you have three classes. And all our interpretation of what happened since the beginning of the 20th century is based on the relationship between the various classes. For example, if you want to understand neoliberalism, you probably know that neoliberalism is a new phase of not capitalism, managerial capitalism, which developed since about uh, 1980. Okay. We call that a social order. Okay? It's a, it is a period now, a few decades, 
too many, but a few decades, okay? And the characteristic, the way, you know, to explain neoliberalism, to understand neoliberalism is classes. Classes, and I will explain that. <sighs> Manager um, neoliberalism is not El Estado. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few sentences of Spanish be entering here, and it's a catastrophe. So, uh, the state, you know, is fighting with the market. Okay, this is not what neoliberalism is about at all. Neoliberalism is a class phenomenon. Hmm? In addition, I'm just back from Latin America, and so it's difficult. But, so, this. Uh, I will enter into some details of that and I move to the rest of the book. Um, because, you see, in the two first part, we produce an interpretation of social relation and the economy in contemporary managerial capitalism. Okay? But, you know, the problem for Marxists is how to change the world. Because, of course, we don't accept class society, and in particular, we don't accept neoliberalism as a social order at all. Okay? It's a historical catastrophe, historical regression. And uh, so, the third part of the book is to study earlier att attempts in history to transform class society in a sense of what Marx and Engels called emancipation. Emancipation from class relations. And so this is the historical part of the book. Very interesting, completely new. And uh, so you see here, the third chapter is utopi utopian capitalism. Because the revolution of the 17th century and 18th century, and also what happened in the US in a sense, were attempts to build, they, they were not attempts, but they were, you know, period of construction of mature capitalism. Okay? But there were what we call it here utopian capitalism, is the idea that it was possible to implement. Uh, advanced forms of democracy within capitalism. This was true in England. For example, in the book we study the laborers, the diggers, and so on, everything we study. And in France, of course, the French Revolution, what was called the La Montagne, the mountain. Maybe you know that, Robespierre. You heard about Robespierre and so on. The idea was to build advanced forms of democracy within capitalism. But, you see, in, from a Marxist point of view, it is impossible. Why? Because capitalism is a class society. And it's not possible to build actual democracy. Democracy which would not be a class democracy, in the sense that upper class would control, you know, despite the existence of democratic forms of government, would control society. And so, something like the culmination of the French Revolution during the convention, what we call a convention, convention uh, a, was an attempt to build a really democratic society based on private ownership of the means of production. It was a huge mistake. It, it was good, but it was impossible because, you know, it's not possible. Why? Because the concentration of capital also concentrates powers in the hands of a minority. And so, uh, the second chapter in this part is Utopian Socialism and Anarchism. Uh, this is, these are the people you know what are Utopian Socialists, okay? The best one, you know, is let's say Owen, okay? Other names are Fourier and so on. So, it's very interesting and KB and uh, many. And so, the idea was, okay, we are in a society, the, the situation of the working class, to use Engels, uh, the, the title of Engels' book, is terrible. 
It's terrible. You know, it's a de devastation. The Industrial Revolution in England, in France, was, as you know, because you read the literature about the 19th century, it was something horrible. So, okay, we build here, we build a new society within the old society, which means that we organize uh, what we call the phalange, I don't know how you pronounce that in English or whatever, okay, like uh, as Owen did in England, in New Lanark, and then in the United States, we build new organization where the worker will work together, we will organize production and so on, and people will eat and live correctly. Well, it was a total failure. And this is very closely related to the problem of management. Because this type of organization were highly managerial organization. Anarchism, no power at all. Okay? No power at all. They were not too concerned about firms, but they were concerned about the, the state. No state, okay? Because if you have a state, you are slaves, okay? So it was a catastrophe. The third one is utopia is self-proclaimed scientific socialism, which, which follows Marx's view and went through the creation of the Social Democratic Party in Germany at the end of Marxist life and then the construction of socialism with Lenin. It means, after Paris Commune, 71, we need a party with a very strong organization. Because if we don't have a party with a very strong organization, we are destroyed by the power of the government, by the army and everything. And in a sense, it succeeded, but finally, as you know, it fell. Why it fell? Because they built a new type of managerial society, which was not very good, okay? And so, this is the bad part of the book. It is how all attempts failed in the past to really create a new society without uh, this kind of a class pattern and class domination. And the last part is the solution. Okay, <laughs> so this is the impossible part of Viusley, and so, so you will read the book at the end of March, okay? And uh, this is the kind of optimistic part of the book. So this is just to give you a broad view of the, what we are trying to do huh, in our work of researchers, not in macroeconomics, but the, but still, there is a relationship, of course, with macroeconomic because of crisis, uh, as you know. So now, I forget about all that. No, this was just the introduction. Uh, and uh, now I will show you at least the beginning, uh, which is the empirical aspect. And I will just try to show you why we believe that there is a very strong empirical basis for what we are telling. So now you can wake up, you are economist, you are familiar with the use of data, okay? So I will show data. Okay, so first here. We are in the United States. In this graph, we are using PKT size data about inequalities, but we are not interested in inequalities, okay? And uh, of course, the di diagram and the interpretation are ours. So I explain what it is about. So please listen one minute, uh, what it is about. I repeat, we are in the United States. You can see the period from World War I to 2011 here. We will consider two groups of fractiles, okay? So you are familiar with this notion. I can go fast. The first fractile here is 1995. I'm below the figure here. Yeah. Okay, 1995 in the hierarchies of incomes, okay? You, if you don't follow, just tell me. And a second fractile is the top one person, which is the fractile 90. 9, 100, 
OK? So hierarchy of income, people with low income on the floor, the top, top one person, and we consider another group between uh, 90 and 95 in the hierarchy of income. You understand that? And the question is, what is the composition, what is the nature of the income of these groups? We distinguish between two categories of income. One category is capital income. Capital income is dividend, interest, rents. Okay? This is national accounting. And the other group are wages. Wages plus supplements. Salary is if you want. Okay? And so we have two categories of income. There are other income for independent workers, but they are not very important and they do not change really historically. So the variable in the diagram here is what is the share or percentage of wages in the total income of within these two fractiles? Okay? One is share of wages in the total of wages plus capital income. So, of course, we also have the importance of capital income. So, I begin with the top curve here. We are in the fractile 1995. Yeah? And uh, the, we can see, you can see the percentage here. So, beginning maybe in uh, around World War II, you can see that 95% of the income of this, of this group okay, was made of wages. Yeah? And this percentage is very stable. Who are they? They are managers. Okay? They are people who make money okay, because they belong to, the, to this group, you know, 90, 95%. They are university professors or they are managers within firms. And their income is made of 95% of wages and supplement. And this means that they have a little bit of capital somewhere. And so they have some in additional income. It's very stable. You can see the variation at the beginning because after the Great Depression, up to the Great Depression, there was still an important sector of a small firms, you know, where people were making profit, but it was the store around the corner, okay? And they disappeared a lot with their important, diminished a lot with uh, the Great Depression. So now we look at the other curve, which is the important one. We are in the top one person, top one person, people with really serious incomes, okay? It means $35,000 a month, for example. We are dealing with families, actually, okay? So these are people who live well. And you can see the transformation here, extremely important. Around the World War I, this, in this group, only 40% of the income was, were wages. 60% were capital income, dividend, interest, and rent, okay? So these people, you could call them capitalists, in the sense that more than half of their income was made of capital income. And this means wealth, OK? And then you can see the transformation. And if you go to the end of the diagram, you can see that now, 2010, OK, which are the latest data that we have, 80% of the income of the top 1% the income are wages. 20% are capital income. So 20% of capital income may be a lot, but these people are basically wage earners. They are high managers, top managers. Top, 1% uh, is a lot. 1% huh? in the US, one family, it means 1,600,000 families, OK? So it's not just a, a small group, okay? It's just a, a other important group. But what is also extremely interesting is it is a steady growth. Here we are dealing with an historical mechanism in which gradually this upper fraction 
in the hierarchy of income is receiving gradually wages and wages and wages. They still have capital income, but capital income is not so important. You could cut capital income. It would not change very much in the average, the situation of this group. Okay? So this is one of the most, of the best empirical expression of the fact that we are moving toward what we call managerialism. The channel you know, of formation of high income is now wages. Okay? for this group. You need really to go to the top of the top of the top to find people huh, whose incomes are basically capital income. But you have to go very high, maybe 16,000 families. Now, I will show you another graph here. And I first explain the graph technically. Here we are dealing with historical transformations since, so I explain the variable. We are considering fractiles at the bottom, you can see 0, 90. You see the black dot uh, below the figure. This means 90% of the population. Okay, we are still in the pyramid of income. 90%, the bulk of the population, 90%. And the variable, uh, the black dot here, is the purchasing power of one family, the, an, of an average family, the average purchasing power of one family, purchasing power means corrected for inflation, in the US along the period. So you can see that, I'm looking at the black dot here, you can see that it was it is an index because everybody has been normalized to 100 in the middle. Okay? So you can see that around World War I, the level according to the index was 30 for the great mass of the population in the US. Then you see we enter with World War II in particular in a period, very sharp rise of the purchasing power of the 0 090 uh, fractile multiplied about by 3. And then it grows slower, and then we enter uh, during the 1970s and 1980s, a completely new period, total stagnation of the purchasing power for the average of the group 0, 090. It's in the US, uh, it, it's terrible, but it's like this. Now, I consider the various fractals that we are here, and I move to the top one. Top one is 99, 99, 100, okay? This means one family out of 10,000 families. Here we are dealing with people whose income is one or two million dollars a month, okay? 16,000 families. And we are considering their purchasing power. So I am at the top of the graph here. Everybody has been normalized to 100 in the middle here. And you can see that during the first period, the purchasing power, not, not the comparative purchasing power, but the absolute purchasing power is diminishing. Okay? And then everybody grows in the middle at about the same speed. And then we enter into neoliberalism. But I'm sorry, I spoke of, uh, no, it's correct. Okay, so uh, you, you, you can see the curve at the, at the end. The purchasing with neoliberalism beginning in the 1980s, the purchasing power of this group was multiplied by 10 between 1980 and now. While the per average purchasing power of the fractile 090 was flat. Okay, so this is Neoliberalism. Ah, wait, neo neoliberalism. This is neoliberalism, okay? So we say that actually capitalism went to three periods, three social order that we characterize in terms of classes. How do we interpret this in terms of classes? During the period of progress of the purchasing power this period here between 20, uh, 30, the Great Depression, 
and the entrance into neoliberalism, alliance between managerial classes and popular classes. And what is called in the US financial repression, in the sense that the purchasing power of upper classes was diminishing. And the data here, which is Piketty's data, are prior to taxes. After taxes, it was a total disaster for these classes. Okay? And, but, you know, when with the entrance into neoliberalism, for political and economic reasons which are related to the crisis of the 1970s, to the failure of socialism, then we enter into a new period, alliance at the top, alliance between managers and capitalist classes. And this is a social basis in terms of classes of neoliberalism. And this is the root of the incredible rise of, of inequalities. Okay? And, but what is the relationship between what I said before about uh, managerialism in the sense of the rise of managers? You see, with neoliberalism, incredible increase of inequality, which correspond to a new political situation which can be interpreted and is interpreted in our work in terms of alliance between classes. Alliance at the top or alliance to the right between managerial and capitalist classes. And this is a catastrophe for popular classes. This is what neoliberalism is about. What is the relationship now with, uh, <coughs> with uh, managerialism itself? You see this incredible increase of inequalities since the 1980s, okay? What is the root of this rising inequality? Neoliberalism allowed for the restoration of the income of capital because we read constantly that in neoliberalism the problem is uh, profit rates, okay? The problem is profitability on own funds and so on? The answer is no. The basic root, basic root of the increase of inequality in neoliberalism was the rise of wages, of high wages. Okay? The wealth itself, inequality of wages increased a bit. Okay? Inequality of capital income increased a bit too. But the fundamental factor of the rise of inequality in contemporary society in the United States is high wages. Incredible increase of high wages. And it is not just the high wages, you know, very, very, very high wages, a very small group. Because you can see this graph is extremely nice. Because it shows you that if, when you go down along the fractals here, the higher you are, the more you increase your wages. Okay? So it's really a fan opening you know, mechanism which is absolutely incredible. And this is a new aspect of inequality in a capitalism which is a managerial capitalism. If I still have a few minutes, extra minutes, okay, uh, I want to show you something about the government in the US. Because the rise of the managerial aspect of firms, the rise of the managerial aspect of the distribution of, of the distribution of income is one aspect, but there is another aspect which is the government. In the US, we are in a society in which the government is huge. Larger than in France. Huh? The government is extremely powerful and economically the government is huge. And here you see the share of government expenses in GDP in the United States. So you can see, you will see in the book, the comments of all that, the increase. And now they reach 33% of total income. And if you read the French, and if you listen to, to French writers, uh, economists, 
you will see, oh, in France, the state is huge. It is smaller than in the US. Why? Because in France, this type of government expenses is larger than 50%. But, you know, in the US, you have only 33%. So it appears to be smaller. But the huge difference is that within, in the US, within government expenses, you don't have the pension, the retirement pension of the private sector. Why in France you have that? And it is huge. Well, and you have other aspects, in particular the problem of health insurance, because in France, within when the people calculate the size of the government, you have a real system, what we call social security, okay, which doesn't exist in the US, where you have a minimum system. So if you add in the US the pensions you know, for uh, retired people, if you add the uh, uh, private health insurance, you are above France. Okay? So just to show you that the characteristic of feature of managerial capitalism is the growth of organization in the sense of firms, but also the growth of the state. Okay? And the United States are moving ahead. It's a very, very socialized society. In the sense that you have huge, uh, huge uh, firms, you know, you also have a huge government. You have, a, you have a very broad fractions of uh, people who are actually managers and more than in France. So I know I was too too long, you have an idea of the book, and you will read the book. And, uh, well, uh, this, I will conclude in this way, okay? This transformation of capitalism, this new class structure, the emergence of materialism, had huge consequences on the historical dynamics of capitalism. Historical dynamics of capitalism, Marx and Engel has this view. Capitalism will, there will be a falling profit rate. The profit rate will diminish. Capitalism will go into more and more and deeper crisis. Okay? But they were forgetting that capitalism is transforming itself constantly. How is it transforming itself? It is transforming itself in the direction of managerialism, because capitalism is transforming itself into managerialism. What is the relationship with the falling profit rate? And what is the relationship with crisis? I begin with the second. Because, you see, one of the functions of government institutions in contemporary capitalism in Europe as well as in the US is the control of the macroeconomy. Okay? We just went through a crisis without the very strong policies, the very strong intervention of the government. This would have been 1930, okay? the Great Depression. But thanks to very strong oh, the organizational power you know, of institution, like the central bank and the government, international cooperation, they were able you know, to correct to some extent for, to avoid the total catastrophe, which was already not bad. And the second aspect, technical change, if you read our work, you will see how the entrance into managerial capitalism, what is called in the US the managerial revolution, allowed for the rise of uh, uh, upward trend of the profitability of capital because it changed totally the course, the course of uh, technical change in the United States. The most famous aspect that you certainly know of this impact of managers on profitability and technical change is Taylorism, Fordism, which is our managers organize production in the workshop with technical achievements which were extremely efficient. 
But this is only one aspect of the managerial revolution because the managerial revolution allows for the increased efficiency of firms in all respects, including all aspects of management, not only in the workshop. And this allowed for the correction of the downward trajectory of the profit rate during various decades. Now, again, capitalism, managerial capitalism, enter a new downward phase you know, of profitability, which will certainly have consequences in the future. But this would be another story. For example, here you have the historical pattern of the, what we call the productivity of capital. It means the ratio output divided by the stock of fixed capital. Okay? We call that a productivity of capital because it's output divided by the stock of capital here. And you see the historical profile. So in the late 19th century, a period of decrease, then the managerial revolution, the transformation of the organization, Taylorism, Fordism, transformation of management, and through the Great Depression and World War II, there was a huge restoration of the level of the productivity of capital. And the productivity of capital is the same thing, I will stop, is the same thing as the profit rate, because the share of profit has been historically constant. Now we are entering into a new period of decline, but this would be, this was the topic of the presentation that I made last year. Okay, so I will stop here and apologize for have been, having been too long. Welcome back. Um, we would like to start by the presentation by walking you through the paper, uh, by presenting a summary of uh, the managerial hypothesis. After that, we will shed some light on managerial hypothesis in uh, hindsight, after which we'll explain what the managerial hypothesis gets right. Um, we'll also talk about what the managerial hypothesis, how can it get better, and then we'll f uh, present our final remarks and then the references. All right, uh, to start with, uh, let me um, start by presenting what is uh, the managerial hypothesis, as uh, explained very well by Gerald, um, the, there is a gradual transformation of uh, capitalist, capitalist relations of production into managerial um, uh, relations in which managers will finally become the upper class, which is leading its way to neoliberalism, which is an alliance between the capitalist and the managers and this is shaping the entire uh, revolution. Furthermore, the paper highlights the PFIZR's data, which allows us to see the regressive redistribution of income in this uh, class, and the rising importance of managers in the organization, and the changes of income, hence fault. The paper also talks about the three social classes um, in uh, the contemporary capitalism, uh, which has gone through different phases over different eras. Historically, these uh, three social orders have uh, you know, existed in the contemporary capitalism, each one based in a different class configuration between the capitalist class, the working class, and the managerial class. The first one of it, which was the first financial hegemony, uh, which existed after the Great Depression and gave rise to the alliance to the right. After which, um, we saw that the impact of Great Depression and World War II led to the social, uh, social worker movement, and hence, alliance to the left um, existed in the industry. Finally, the second financial hegemony gave rise to neoliberalism, um, in which a new alliance to the right and uh, the reestablishment of the capital class was noticed. We can say that uh, neoliberalism as a new phase of capitalism, whose uh, main objective was the restoration and increase of the income and wealth 
of the upper class, as quoted by Gerald in his paper. He goes on to further say that interpret new liberalism as the expression of alliance between capitalist and managerial class in the transition towards managerial relations of production. Um, Gerard has explained this graph very well in which we can see three social orders and hence uh, the average income shift through, uh, through the uh, through the decades, in which in the first phase we see uh, that the income is, uh, you know, more towards the capitalist class. It goes on um, in the year 1940 till 1970. It it merges on, and hence, and after which we we see a further rise and uh, a shift of income uh, towards the capitalist class and the highest fractile uh, in the later phases. I would uh, like to show you some other graphs as well in which we see the similar pattern in uh, three social orders in which the income is uh, you know, distributed towards the higher fractile uh, in, in US, France, and the United Kingdom. Um, in these social orders, um, the same pattern has been observed. Also, uh, the wealth share of the top one person in France, USA, and United States, we see the similar pattern in which um, the top fractile, the top one person, uh, have seen uh, a rise of income in the, in the later periods from 1970 uh, till date. Hello, good morning. Um, okay, so the managerial hypothesis is a really novel idea and it also puts in relation different strands of the literature that are not usually put together. For instance, it links managerialism with Marxism uh, and even with some hypothesis about social classes uh, with the sociology literature and so on. It's a, re it's, a really, it's a really interesting literature. Just to put this in hindsight and the first study that we, I mean, that is commonly acknowledged is that of Berlin Means, in one is where they highlight the separation of ownership and control. This, this is like the seminal work, although it can be said that managerialism features were there much earlier. Even Marx highlights uh, the complex division of labor within the factory in capital. We also have other authors, for instance, Burnham in the managerial revolution also argues that capitalism will disappear and it will not be followed by socialism, but rather by uh, another class, that of the managers, broadly defi uh, defined, again, with the private and the public sectors as a business executive, technicians, bureaucrats, and soldiers. Also coming from another perspective, we have uh, Schumpeter, we argue that the success of capitalism would actually lead to its demise, to socialism, and this would precisely happen because of the absentee ownership that will happen when firms get ripped off the entrepreneurs and they get replaced by managers, creating this giant bureaucratic um, structure that will ultimately finish with capitalism. Moving a little bit forward, we have the, fa the, the famous thesis of Chandler about the visible hand of the um, of the management as opposed to the invisible hand of the market. A little bit later came this, uh, the professional managerial class hypothesis by Heinrich Barbara and John. They were a couple writing together in, in, this, um, in this book edited that was called Between Labor and Capital. So the issue about social classes and the hybridization was already present. In the, in the Marxist literature, and basically they asked, they lumped together managers and professions and argued that this is the new, third, the middle class in capitalism, just as Menil is pointing out. So this managerial, managerialism um, literature really blossomed during the Keynesian New Deal from the 30s up to the 80s. But then from the, from the 80s onwards, it's kind of fell in disgrace, mainly because of the attack of agency theory and the literature interlocking directors. Jensen and Meckling uh, frame this issue in terms of the problem between agent and ownership, 
And basically, they argued that shareholder, uh, shareholder value maximization was the best outcome to, for a more efficient distribution of resources that will benefit all the parts. And in order to align the interests of management and um, ownership, they proposed these stock-based options that will later be an important part of the empirical definition in the, this ratio between wages and total income. As Lasonic put, put out later, from the 80s onwards, this actually eliminates the conflictive relationship between ownership and management since now their interests are put together through these mechanisms of, uh, for instance, stock-based options and later on share buybacks. But uh, Dumanil and Levy managerial hypothesis can answer back. Managerialism is still a thing because the class alliance is not the class conflict is not between managers and owners, but indeed it's between managers, owners versus the, the working class. And this is the new alliance to the right that neoliberalism represents. What do we have to get from all this? Two main ideas. First, the idea of the managers as a new social class that it may actually need to a new mode of production has been present from, for a long time. And second, that the class of managers is frequently ill-defined. It includes things as technicians, professionals. It can also include proper managers, middle management, CEOs. So this category is troublesome indeed. Um, I would like to emphasize on what the managerial hypothesis get, gets right at this point. Uh, well, to the first point is that it highlights very well the struggle between uh, the class and the dynamics of the relation of production. Uh, which these points are often overlooked in academia. Um, however, the managerial hypothesis explains it very well. The other thing that we can see is that unlike any Marxist, it's flexible and willing to go further beyond the Marx legacy uh, to Canadian compromise and include neoliberal man uh, modern uh, models of capitalism. It has a strong empirical work uh, behind it, and it directs the trajectory of uh, evolution of relations of production, um, which uh, impose a new, uh, which impose uh, progress and emancipation. Uh, to prove my point, I would like to uh, give a few examples from history. We would compare uh, the old era and the very modern era. For comparison, consider the Medici Bank of uh, Italy in the 15th century. It was operated only through seven branches and had only 57 workers. If you compare that with modern banks, you would see the difference. And to emphasize it more, it, it was very powerful at that time. Um, out of these 57 workers, um, only a dozen were considered as managers. Now, if you compare that with the U.S. Industrial Revolution, um, right after their railroad and telegraph network was introduced, uh, this led to a huge, massive uh, revolution in their economy, and um, uh, they were uh, the highest uh, GDP per capita at that time. And in 1850, their population, which was equal to uh, Britain at that time, it became double in 1900 and triple in 1920. Um, the industry, the industry took advantage of this, and um, you know, um, uh, industrial revolution uh, was set. Uh, in motion, and um, global industries, global uh, companies were established, and high volume um, uh, products were being marketed at that time. It started with that. So, uh, we have seen what the managerial hypothesis get right. Let's look at what it can get better. First, some empirical issues. Lassonic actually wrote a reply to the text that we're given to read, that is uh, this another reading of Figgetti, his science and Sutman data, to show the managerial hypothesis. And they showed that this graph actually about the sum of wages over the wages and capital income uh, has a little flaw because in Piketty's data, things like stock-based options from 1950 to 1976 they appear as capital income, and from 1981 onwards, they appear as labor income. And this distorts a little bit the picture of these wagers towards and at the top. That's a first point. A second point that we do not mention here, because it slightly modifies the picture, but not that much, is that um, when Gerardo Menil and Levy put that graph, they exclude capital gains. That's a really cumbersome issue, and we are also abstracting from that. 
But then if there is a more important issue about how to identify social classes, right? It seems, and it was uh, clear from your presentation, Gerard, that you look at social classes, or you, are, you have the idea of managers, and you use the proxy of income. So you infer that from the rise of wages in the upper income levels, that must be the managers. And from there they infer that these high wages are the new channel of extraction of surplus labor. Right? This is a, but this, of course, poses a problem. Right? Because, uh, as we know from Marxism, the classes are defined by the relationship of, the, of people to the means of production, right? Of course, this is not as simple as it looks. I mean, here, for instance, we have the work of uh, Eric Wright Onling, a sociological Marxist, and we show that just by um, doing a little bit more complex distributions, many categories arise, and this is, of course, an issue that has um, been a problem for Marxism since a long time. But let's take to these basic definitions, and in order to see who is important here, let's look at what is the income of managers, what is the income of workers, and capitalists are a little bit harder to define. So how do we use this? We are going to look at Black Second Income Study Database data here, I think Bennett Gurman. <laughs> I mean, this is based on, um, on the sidelines fact we present for varieties of capitalism course with Cedric Duran. We look at this data from 1979 onwards, it's point estimate, this is survey data, it's not, like, it's not combined with national accounts like uh, Piketty's data. And we look at total pre-tax income, right? The sum of labor income and capital income arising from all these sources and also, yes? How do we define the occupational categories? Managers, these are defined according to the United Nations classifications. So managers strictly are, as you see, managing directors, CEOs, senior official legislators, capturing this from both the public and the private sectors, and then middle range management. Professionals and technicians are the second and third categories, and they are proper professionals and technicians. They do not occupy a uh, managerial role, but they are high-skilled labor, in a sense. While minor and industrial workers are the seventh and eighth categories, normally regarded as low-skilled workers in all the sectors that we can see here, metal, building, food processing, retail, mo machine operators, it's not just a factory worker. Warning, this data is not strictly comparable with Piketty science segment data. It's not strictly comparable. This data, is, uh, the data that Piketty and Science Sukman use is much more robust, spans over a longer time period, and essentially, um, essentially our data is survey data and the problems of under-reporting, especially at the top of the income distribution, are especially known from this data. But it allows us to look at the occupational categories. So let's go look. What we see here is that the neoliberal managerial capitalist period from 1979 to 2013, and we have different classes, and what we can show here is that indeed, in the data the overall top 10% income share is increasing, so this matches the actual data, on because it's science and Sukman. But what we see here is that the managers, they have a rise, but they have a mild rise in the 90s. In the 80s, they faced the uh, hostile takeovers, and the big winners of this whole period are professionals and technicians. They are not managers, so it's this high-skilled labor. While the big losers are craftsmen and industrial workers, the working class people that we knew. But that is the big divide that this is uh, showing us. Leisure and tears here are defined as um, people that do not have an occupation, but are above the median income, and the capital income is no more than 10% of the labor income. I mean, of course, it's a you can question this definition, we're happy to change it. Okay, uh, so that already poses some theoretical issues because if that's really a picture, this whole thing about the alliance between capitalists and managers in neoliberalism kind of fell, fell apart if we take this, but we must take this with a pinch of salt. And that will also drive us to consider other theories like cognitive capitalism, knowledge capitalism, and so on. Moving towards the proper managerial hypothesis that we are moving towards managerial relations of production, 
Uh, first, why would capitalists engage into an alliance with managers if this would actually ultimately lead to undermine the basis of the domination as a class? Uh, this is a point that needs further development, we think. Also, the distinct between managerial neural capitalism as a transition phase and managerialism as a mode of production seems to be just in terms of a quantity aspect. How much managers are getting and not a quality aspect. What is the very nature of this relation of production? Um, precisely, what are the defining fixtures of the managerialist mode of production as opposed to capital, uh, capitalist mode of production are not developed as we would like? I mean, if we do a simple chart, I mean, this is Marxism 101, uh, we see that the only real change is that who is the dominant class, but what is the wage relation? What production is carried for and the property of the means of production remains the same. Um, maybe the answer is here, it's not published yet, we'll love very much love to do. Maybe probably the answer is here, but in the text we are given, this one not really discussed in depth. And that's, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, all right, guys, so the floor is open for um, questions now. We'll do three rounds and uh, let's uh, get as many questions as we can. Please. I'm Maria from option B. Um, as far as I understood, you see a crisis in the hegemony of the financial hegemony of the United States in this last phase of uh, the capitalism. I would like to know your opinion about uh, the role of China and if China is, would take this position as uh, hegemony and uh, how do you see that? And uh, a second question is uh, about the other countries in the world economy, because you talk about Europe and the United States and how this uh, shift in the power of the classes happens in this uh, center economies. But in the periphery, actually, the relations keep the same, if not uh, even more in uh, deep than they were before. So the over exploitation of the working class. So I would like to know your opinion about that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor. My name is Akonde Emanuel. I'm from uh, Option A. I would like to ask if we consider uh, Managerial, uh, managerialism as innovation, as a pro, uh, production process innovation. As what? A production process innovation. How do we then uh, explain the coexistence of the old relations and the new uh, uh, relations? Even if we assume um, managerialism as a systemic uh, innovation and not radical innovation, then the uh, my second question is, if we consider the, uh, the uh, wages of the uh, manager as cost, as an additional cost of uh, production, can we uh, conclude that the reason why there's a drop in the uh, income level of the elite, that is the, the, the owners, is not only due to tax, but also a rise in cost of, uh, of, uh, of production? Then, if this is true, then how does this affect your uh, empirical analysis? Maria? Hi, thank you for the presentation. It was very insightful. I am Mar okay. I am Mariam Ahmed. I wanted to ask you, how do you see the prospects of capitalism and neoliberalism? Because they are quite in-hand phenomena. Both of them uh, move together in a way. Because capitalists quite transform the neoliberal policies according to their interests, the way they want in any country, no matter what is it a developing country or a developed country. But um, 
how can we see capitalism in the coming eras of development how will it transform itself will the exploitation of labor and will the exploitation of market and the transformative and tailored terms of neoliberalism will take place in a way that it has been taking place or will is there a room for these marxist approaches to endure in No, I have a microphone. Well, <clears throat> I'm supposed also to answer the. So, <clears throat> first, uh, I think that. Uh, Regarding the definition of ma managers are as class, okay, uh, you you also have to to understand the perspective of, of a paper, okay. Uh, we, it's true that, for example, in the paper that you read, which is entitled "Another Use of PKT Data," we use PKT size and Zuckman data to speak about managers, but it doesn't mean at all that you can define a class only by income hierarchies. Not at all, okay? We define classes. Well, uh, you have various aspects. First, relations of production is a rather complex uh, mechanism. And uh, the first thing is, Marx, as I said, you know, the position, the relationship with the means of production with a collective aspect in the case, uh, in capitalism, but also in the case. So we do not mean that the, the criterion in the definition of a class is income. But when we write a paper, of course, we use a lot income. Why? Because, yes, exploitation has something to do with income. Okay? And classes are about exploitation. The appropriation, you know, the extraction of a surplus. So, of course, it has a lot to do with income. But income is not the, the bottom line of the definition of what a class is about, which has to do with uh, the relationship with the means of production, with this collective aspect in particular in managerialism. It has to do with powers. It has to do it has cultural aspects. It has many aspects. Okay. And in, of course, there is a strong bias in this paper that you read because, you know, it's about income. The paper is about income, and so now it's true that you are, we are using a lot of incomes, okay? Because uh, these are data that we have, <coughs> uh, and they are so telling, in our opinion, you know. But it's certainly not definitional. For example, this graph here. I'm not sure I understand well. When you show managers here, yes. you are speaking according to some categories that I will not discuss. The share of the income of some people that you call managers is about constant in total income distribution. Exactly. Okay. So this has nothing to do with a... But this picture remains the same if you look at the top 10%, at the top 1%. And this is the total share to look at the alliances and the general winners and losers. Because, of course, when you go to just the 1%, the importance of craftsmen and industrial workers, they have almost no income there. But this picture remains. So you are saying that the income of upper classes, there was no concentration of income toward upper classes? No, the concentration of income towards upper classes is clearly shown by the black line, which is the overall term, term share, which is increasing. Okay. What I'm saying is that if you do this, just for the top, uh, if you look within the 1%, the picture is roughly the same, especially the division. OK, so you mean that actually, but the problem is what you call managers, OK, in, in this, because you, you cannot deny, at least according to the data that you are you, we are using, you know that there is a very strong increase of high wages. 
Okay, so, so a concentration of income toward high wages. So now you can come and say these high wages are very high wages, are not wages of managers. They are professionals. They are professionals, of course, but we, we uh, professionals and managers. We, 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 okay, there is a, a definitional problem here, of course, you know. Uh, uh, well, because you see, we, we make presentations which are extremely short, uh, of course. For example, to us, our concept of manager is a broad concept of manager. For example, a medical doctor, which has no uh, uh, managerial activity in the sense of uh, we classify this group as a specific category of managers, okay? Uh, so I would have to look at your at your data seriously, but I'm not too convinced be, because because it, the problem I exactly the, the problem is definition what you call professional in particular in the U.S. and what you call managers. So I would have to look exactly you know at the what, what we say you know that there is a category of people who have the knowledge, who have the authority, who have your, and we call this group a very broad group as managers globally. Okay. And so what we say is that you have now, we believe, you know, that uh, when you look, for example, at Piketty and size data, you have a concentration of income in favor of this group of people. And uh, in my opinion, it's hard to deny that empirically, okay? Now I would have to see exactly what is the definition of professional here, okay? It's, uh, it, it was in the presentation. It's what? It was in the presentation and it's taken by the definition of the United Nations International. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, but I, I would have to look exactly what they mean, okay? You gave your sources, but uh, we have to look at the definition there, okay? And, uh, <coughs> well, there was this terrible paper by Lazonic, you know, about, uh, but he, he read one line, you know, of what we wrote and he thought he had some understanding and, uh, of course, you know, the, the, it's perfectly true that sometimes real exercise stock options were in, were not in. Now, when you say that we don't consider capital gains, it means that in the graphs that we present, we did not include capital gains because we want to have, doesn't mean that we never s drew graph with capital gains. Of course we did. Okay, but the problem with, with capital gains is that it's fluctuating tremendously and it doesn't change the historical tendencies. So we decided to give up. At some point we smoothed a little bit, you know, because it's going up, it's going down and so on. And so we tried to have a readable uh, graph which can be interpreted. So we decided we better skip it because it doesn't change anything. Okay, but it doesn't think that we don't look. Of course we look at that, okay. So um, the problem is that uh, if you include anything, you know, just people absolutely do not understand what you are speaking about, okay? So, so you, of course, we are simplifying, okay? And um, I could show you the graphs, okay? And so when, no, 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 not only, I mean, not only published graph, okay, but when we enter into national accounting, okay, if you look at this sort of data, we will draw maybe 100 graphs, distant graphs, and then we pick up one which we think can be interpreted and so on. So, so it, uh, it's always a conflict, okay, a conflict if you want to be, to include absolutely everything, or if you want to simplify, uh, to be understood. And, uh, s but I can tell you that this is something that we really studied. Mm. And uh, now, uh, well, there were some points at the end, maybe. Um, uh, yes, w what we show about the table, you know, the various criteria de de defining a class, you know, if they purchase. Of, of course, you know, I mean, the, the manager, the do they purchase the labor of other people as collective aid of a firm? For example, they do purchase the, the, the work of other workers, okay? From which they derive their own income. Of course they do that, you know. You, you cannot answer. If you, if you assume that only the capitalist own the firm and the capitalist as owner of the firm hire workers, only capitalists hire workers. But if you assume the 
if you consider the collective power of a manager over the firm, because they are the people, Marx already understood that, who make decisions, they do hire workers, okay? And they extract a surplus labor from these workers. So it's, uh, I'm speaking of the table with only right and so on. I don't see the meaning of this table at all, okay? Because you assume what you want to, 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 to deny, you know? If you assume that the decisions are made by capitalists, good. Okay, so the capitalists are the upper class, and they are other workers, including, including managers. So, of course, the manager also, the same story, the manager are the agent. Yes, they are the agents, you know, to the point where they are not, the, they are the deciders. Uh, I have not presented, but you know the book, uh, the grand, uh, the, La Grande Bifurcation, you know, that we show where the power of managers is now, so you have to enter into that. So I will <coughs> stop for you. Uh, we would need certainly more time. And uh, now uh, there was, I'm not sure I understood all the questions. Okay, I was here, it was difficult. And uh, the question about the hegemony of China and other countries. Okay. Well, China is building capitalism, okay? China is building capitalism. China is building managerial capitalism, obviously. Huh? China is building managerial capitalism. Uh, it's not really, up to now, neoliberal managerial capitalism, in the sense that they, why? Because the control of the government is very strong. Okay. It doesn't mean that the government is weak within in the United States, you know, I said the opposite. But you see the intervention of the government in the economy is also very strong. So it's not possible now to contend that uh, China is really a neoliberal country, but it is a, more and more a, a particular category of managerial capitalism. And it's very useful, you know, to have the concept of managerial capitalism to understand what China is about. Are they going to dominate the world in the future? The answer is, um, I don't know. I'm not sure, okay? Because uh, you see what's happening now. Uh, of course, you know, the, you, if you consider the, the size of the economy, I mean the output, if you consider industry, yes, everybody knows that the United States is losing ground, you know, on the, in this respect. But you see how complex is the story because uh, you, you, you know that, for example, in the United States now we have Trump, okay? So this means that the type of policy and the type of trajectory that the U.S. was following, okay, and that the U.S. would have followed with Hillary, Clinton, Hillary Clinton, for example, is significantly dis different of what the trajectory that the U.S. are, not, are following now. Uh, and so I have not presented this part of the story, but you I don't know if you, if you know the book, that, The Great uh, Transformation, because we have a chapter which is also in the book and in other paper when we present, we use the Orbis data, database, uh, uh, the data of the uh, Orbis data. You know the Orbis da database, okay? Which is uh, the, 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 all the, the financial system in the world, how they control uh, the corporations, uh, transnational corporations, and so on. This is extremely important. And in particular, the international aspect, which shows the central role played by the United States and the United Kingdom, then the relationship to Europe, and so on, and so on. So there is now, this is one uh, aspect of the book and the other papers that we wrote, and also in La Grande Bifurcation, which is that Actually, we have two governments now in the world, okay? We have two categories of government. You have nat national governments, okay? And you have this huge financial structure worldwide, uh, which is organized with the unit financial institution of the United States and the, at the center, and the United Kingdom, and then this 
huge financial network and so on. So th I mean the, the future of uh, uh, managerial capitalism internationally it will depend a lot of the uh, capability of this huge financial system which is now co controlling the large economy to dominate the world economy. It will depend on the capability of, the, of a country like China to build an alternative to this system. Okay? I don't want to go back to the projection that I have here because it would take time, but you would see, according to the OBS database, you would see what is this huge system and what China is about. Okay? China is a large economy in the sense that they are producing every year more, you know, but they are not integrated and they are not building so far something equivalent or something looking like this huge monster, uh, uh, huge global monster, you know, which controls the, wor the, the world large economy. Nothing like this now is happening. Okay, so, so it's extremely difficult to tell the future. I'm sorry, I cannot show the, the graph, you know, but you have to understand that the world economy, the large economy, is dominated by a huge financial system, okay, of trans which control transnational corporation, and they, according to the Orbis data, database, they control 92% of all profits in the world, okay? So this is absolutely huge. Okay, China is moving ahead, but so far they have not been not been able to build anything similar. Okay, and they, they, what will be the nature of the relationship of a new ruling class in China with this system is still very unclear. But there is no equivalent. So, but of course, you know, as now if we speak of output of production on the ter territory, as is very well known, the U.S. are moving backward, okay, and China is moving forward, okay, by the, 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 the capitalist, uh, the managerial capitalist system in the world is another reality, is something above all that, is really something above all that. I'm sorry, this would be the topic of another presentation, and to, to go through, through, through that. So I'm just, I cannot tell, you know, of course, you know, nobody knows what will be the relationship of the new capitalist managerial class in China and this huge international institution. How they will articulate themselves to that. Nobody knows that. So far they didn't. So far they didn't. Okay? And this system remains extremely powerful in the world. Uh, now the other countries, for example, I spoke because I spoke of the United States, I spoke, I should have spoken of the United Kingdom and so on. It's obvious that capitalism in Latin America, for example, I like to travel to Latin America, I'm just back, okay, and so capitalism in these countries is different, just like the capitalism, the U.S. capitalism, this system and capitalism is French, in France are, some, are different things, okay? It doesn't mean, obviously, that they are completely different. For example, a country in Latin America, of course Mexico because of the relationship with the U.S., but of course Brazil or any other country, Argentina, they are part of the world system that I just described. Be why? Because they have the big transnational corporation on their ground. They are part of that. But of course, the stru social structures of capitalism in this country are still closer to the, tradi to traditional, the traditional structures of traditional capitalism. In this sense, they are less managerial capitalism than the United States, or they are even less managerial capitalism than France, knowing that France is also a distinct type of managerial capitalism. And this we can see also in the data, of course, you know, and in particular with the income data, because what I have presented for the U.S. 
the three periods that we call social order, for example, you know that in France, we don't have that. In the sense that now in France, yes, there is a beginning, the beginning of a concentration of income in high wages in France. It's supposedly, you know, it's, it's appearing, you know. Piketty wrote an article in Le Monde, uh, maybe one month ago, I don't remember, when he shows that. He shows that by considering the half of the population period. It's very, very misleading. Very, very misleading. But he shows that. That He shows what? That this is true in the US and in, in the United Kingdom. It is not true in Germany. It is not true in France. Okay? So, so I the difference with the, if we compare with China, for example, is that I believe that France is ready to follow the U.S. path. We are beginning to follow the U.S. trajectory, but we are still rather different. And one superficial but very important aspect is the dynamics of income inequality, because we see that we are maybe beginning, but we are just beginning is something completely new, okay? So, of course, if we make a presentation about the rise of uh, managerial capitalism, I, I make this presentation, I concentrate on the US, okay? But it doesn't mean that the rest of the world, it is the same story. Brazil is, is also different in a sense, although they are part of, also of the world system. France is something different in, in another sense, and so on. So we have to enter into the complexity of all that. What I have obviously not done and what we don't do in the paper on which we commented, but in other, in other uh, works. Uh, so, <coughs> problem is that, uh, is it reversible? I is it clear that we will, for example, is, does the US trajectory show the path that France will follow? I'm sorry to say that with Macron, we are ready, okay? This is exactly what we are beginning to do now, very clearly. Does it mean that Germany is following the same path? We show in papers and in the book, La Grande Bifurcation, that actually you have two Germanys. You have one, if you look at the Orbis database, you have, it's very interesting because you have two Germany. You have a Germany which is a traditional industrial Germany inherited from the post-World War II decades, and you have the other Germany with Deutsche Bank and so on, which is a financial Germany and so on. And they exist uh, side by side. And this explains the quote-unquote success of the German economy. Even within one country, you have two distinct structures. So now the big question is, shall we all converge towards the monster which we find in the Orbis database? You know, shall we all converge to that? Will China enter into that? Or will China build an alternative system? And the answer is we don't know. And be because we believe that it is not determined yet. It is not determined yet. It will depend politically. It will depend of Macron, it will depend of Trump, it will depend of Xi Jinping in China, and so on. These are policies which are followed, and I'm not sure that everything is programmed for the future. And so, I don't know if I understood well the, the question about innovation. Neoliberalism, is in neoliberalism in innovation? Was that your question? Can you speak a little louder? I said I was asking if we consider uh, uh, managerialism as a form of innovation in the in the production in the production process. Uh, okay, so I can maybe answer to that. Uh, neoliberalism is the last phase in managerial capitalism. It began around. 1980, let's say, okay, within countries of the center. It was exported to some extent to the rest of the world. So is it an innovation? It is an historical social innovation in the sense that we move 
from the previous social order to a new social order. But now, if you mean by innovation, not social innovation, but technology and so on, the answer is not, no. There are trajectory of technology, technical change, and so on. Uh, innovation in the organization of production, this is not neoliberalism. Although, you know, everything which happened now is about uh, neoliberalism. And I have even more difficulty to understand the third question. What was it? Can you? But managerial capitalism and managerialism is still exploitation. It is, it is the complex of social relation, and it is still mass production. Okay? Capitalism is, when we speak of managerialism as a new mode of production, it means a new dominating, a new upper class, okay? which is now working in alliance with capitalist classes. So all the features of social relations which are related to the fact that we live within a class society, within a class mode of production, will be conserved with new features, of course. Okay? So the end of capitalism, the end is not the transition. I explained at the beginning the transition from one mode of production to the other is a very long process, and this is what we are witnessing now. But the features that you mentioned, like mass production, like exploitation, etc., are conserved, of course. You know, there is absolutely no, it's not, there is no simple expression of a transformation to which we, uh, that we, we could mention. Of course, it's continuing. What is the future? The future is also related to one of the points that you made, I made at the end. Why? capitalist classes enter into alliance between, with managerial classes instead of because during the post-war decades capitalist classes lost a huge unsinkable ground okay they after I have not no time to show the data but they are well known and they are in the paper in the 1970s the income and wealth of, the comparative income and wealth of capitalist classes had incredibly diminished, incredibly diminished. They were finished, okay? They were finished. So they were able to have this new alliance with managerial classes, and within this alliance, both upper fraction of the two upper classes in alliance were able to joining their uh, their fight if we can say their in class struggle they were able to both restore their income both why did they do that because they were finished according to the rules of the post-war compromise they were finished so they took advantage of the crisis in 1970 they took advantage of the failures of the country of self-proclaimed socialism they took advantage of the future of the failures of the post-war compromise to restore their income into huge proportion but they do that now in the united states and in england under the leadership of managerial classes they had to accept that and what they are doing is that they are gradually transforming themselves into managers okay they go on owning their capital and making profit out of that. But gradually, they had to move back to firms. They are paying to themselves very high wages. They are gradually entering into the new course of relations of production to survive of a class. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> yeah. One, one I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I speak too much, so you stop me, okay? No mm. <laughs> one last round of questions, and then we'll be done for the day. Uh, I'm Thiago from 
uh, option speak B. Speak loud because the microphone okay. doesn't... Uh... I'm Thiago from option B. Yeah. I will keep on this final discussion that we were talking because uh, I'm interested in that. Uh, is about the relationship between the managers and the capitalists. And now you said that the managers are the leaders in this relationship, but just I would like to that you explain more how this relationship and uh, the power between them, how it's structured and so on. If you can read French, okay, read, read the Great Bif La Grande Bifurcation, or you will read the new book because I'm ready to stop, but I need two hours to explain that. Uh, because with the data and with the mechanisms, okay, and so uh, there is, we have a concept, uh, the relation, where the, the relationship between capitalist owner and managers occur. We call that, how do you say, the interface? Yes. The in interface between ownership and management. And here we enter into the institution of boards of director, great large financial institution, insider and outsider, and so on. And I start the story if you want, but it's it's a very it's a very long story. Hmm. Hi, Benedict. I'm from Option B. Um, I made this graph, and therefore I would like to just very briefly elaborate on it, and then uh, ask you a question. With how the term man managerial capitalism relates to financial capitalism. Because what we made this graph to kind of show can we find your theory uh, in the Lisb uh, uh, Luxembourg Income Study Database. And what we found was that actually another theory by two sociologists called Dobbin and Soren. Um, kind of is more present, but it might just be uh, on the question on how do we define managers. So in there, managers are defined as people who actually manage other people, so who hire and fire other people. While professionals and technicians, they are engineers, um, analysts, etc. So people with high uh, university degrees and high wages. Now, what Dobbin and Soren argue is that uh, they call it the myth of shareholder value. They argue that actually uh, a new group, and that's not the managers that uh, rose, but a new group of financial intermediaries rose, and they were, ab uh, were able to change the incentives of both managers and, leisure, uh, and rentiers and capitalists so that they get an intermediation fee, um, which is then paid out as wages to a new class of professionals, Wall Street people. So we would see that in, an, in financial analysts, we would see that in um, takeover specialists, and so on and so forth. But these people don't manage other people, so they don't hire other people. Um, but they extract, extremely, they extract extremely high wages through their intermediation. And we can also see that in the rise of the financial intermediaries where households don't ha hold uh, capital directly anymore, but they hold financial products from BlackRock, etc., etc. So that's just to kind of elaborate on that graph a bit more. And then the question, uh, is it just that we misunderstood the term managers and you actually would put the financial professionals in that group? Or do I have a complete okay, different... Okay, thank you. Very yeah, first, we'll take all the questions and then... No, I would like to answer to this one because it's too, it's too much. Okay. And uh, uh, no, thank you for your question, which is very good. Uh, I'm sorry we don't use this data, okay? So you will send me uh, or can probably find it and we will look at it, okay? So I cannot really comment technically, but we are measuring everything we know, and we don't know that, so uh, we will do it, okay? And uh, mm. uh, so, so we will look at this data. Now, there is obviously a very, as I mentioned briefly, there is a problem of definition. We would never define manager only by the cri criterion that they hire and fire people. This extremely narrow definition of management. If you look to our work, okay, of course we pay uh, crucial attention, and this was the beginning of your comment, we know, to uh, financial managers, 
okay? To, to us, you know, for example, financial manage First, we don't have this definition, which is extremely narrow, okay? In our opinion. Because, well, uh, I don't want to start uh, uh, to speak too much, but you see, we absolutely do not have this type of definition. And for example, we pay a lot of attention to the relationship between the wages and supplements of financial managers and the wages of other managers, okay? We draw graphs on this. And we would never say that these managers who are, for example, I mentioned the OBIS database and other related studies. People who work in the large financial institution, their job is to sit within boards of directors. Many of them, you know, we uh, use a lot of studies by sociologists and so on. They may sit within 50 distinct, distinct uh, boards of directors, okay? Here, they represent financial institutions. They are the financial managers. They are the top, actually, with wages which are almost twice higher than other category of big managers. To us, these are... Of course, we classify these people as managers. They are the top managers, in our opinion, in our categories, okay? So, so that's the reason if I want to look at this data, I have to see exactly how do they select the people. But you see, the, I think there is a very big problem of definition. It, it, they use a very narrow definition, which is some uh, category of lower category of traditional management, which is the people who are working in what in French is called human resources, you know. I am not sure it's used really in English, which means hiring and firing people. They are managers, but they are not at all the big managers, okay? They are not the people who are making the big, the, the big uh, uh, wages, you know, and the big supplement at the end of the year, okay? Not at all. So I believe there is a very, uh, or they can be, managers can also be technicians, you know, in the sense that they are people who are in charge of research and development and so on. These people are not in what we call human resources of hiring and firing, and they can work with small groups of people that they, that they organize. Of course they are managers, okay? In our, in our definition, managers means yeah, of course, there is a lot of uh, our Marxist I I inspiration is very strong if you want to understand our perspective because Marx in Capital explained uh, very well, you know, what he called the capitalist functions. Okay, because Marx explained that being a capitalist represents a lot of work, you know, the act what he calls the functioning capitalist. And he explains the function, functioning capitalist He's organizing production, he's going through the markets, he's collecting the funds to increase the activity of the firm and so on. And what happened with the managerial revolution, and which is of course a gradual process, is the delegation of all these tasks to salaried workers at the top of the hierarchy. But we would never restrict you know, the managerial function to the fact of hiring or firing people, which is one aspect and which is not at all at the top, really, of the managerial hierarchy in our definition, okay? And it's very clear, you know, for example, in the new book, we, you will see the graphs, you know, with the, the wages, of, uh, wages and supplements of financial managers and other managers, okay? Or fin uh, people working in the financial sector and other people. To, to us, this is the top of the managerial category. It's not at all outside of that. Now, you see, this is a problem of terminology. In French, we have the concept of CAD, which is difficult. In the US, you have the concept of manager. But you, you can go to a store, you know, and you see uh, here there is a butcher working, and he's called the managers, okay? In New York, uh, uh, what we call in French a concierge, he's called the super. He's called the superintendent. Okay, so now it's called a super. Okay, uh, it has absolutely no, no meaning, you know. Why not admiral or I don't know what? Because it, so, so we are here the victim of the terminology. But one advantage of the US is that they, they have the concept of managerial capitalism. 
They don't know what a manager is about because the word has no meaning. Okay? But they have managerial capitalism and we think it's good. And so we, we understand. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can I say that? Well, I'm Brenda from Option 8. Uh, I would like to make reference to Bourdieu's theory uh, about um, social, cultural, symbolic capital. Uh, as managers uh, have significant uh, uh, cultural social capital, I would like to know if this new form of uh, capitalism would imply a rise in this uh, other, a, a rise in the relative importance of these types of capital in relation to the economic capital. No, okay, can you repeat? I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry. Please, please, please articulate a lot because <laughs> uh, I have difficulty to, to understand you. Yes, I, I would like to know if um, this new form of capitalism would imply a rise in the relative importance of the cultural, social and symbolic capital in terms of Bourdieu's theory in relation to the economic capital as can you can you explain me? If Il parlait de qui? Bourdieu. Bouvier, l'historien. Ah Bourdieu, ah j'avais ah. pas compris du tout. Ah Bourdieu, d'accord. Mais Bourdieu, c'est... Ah. <laughs> In the book, we, we discuss Bourdieu analysis briefly, okay? But it's very strange because Bourdieu, as you know, has distinguishes between various categories of capital. Uh, and uh, so you have wealth, in a sense, which is a more Marxian, but you are also have cult culture, knowledge, okay? Which is another category. So Bourdieu was exactly perfect to speak of managers in, in uh, contemporary society, but he didn't, okay? And in Bourdieu system, the firm, you know that Bourdieu distinguishes between fields, okay? Various fields. There is no field for enterprises. Bourdieu doesn't know enterprises, okay? Very strange, he has a field for education, a field for everything, except firms. He never heard about firms, okay? So, so, it's very strange. He has a capital which is social, he has capital social relations, the ownership, and he has knowledge, you know, now. Very good. So finally, we, ha we have a theoretician. Actually, as you said, the literature is huge, you know, on this topic, but not in France. And Bourdieu is a very good example of that. There is a second very good example, or extremely bad example, in France, which is Foucault. Okay? <laughs> And they are people who, they live in a world where, in our opinion, the managerial phenomenon is a huge phenomenon. If you look at the literature in English, if you look in the US and even in England to this literature, it's huge, okay? As you mentioned, and it's very old. But these sociologists or philosophers like Foucault, who is a philosopher, they don't know about those managers. They never heard about that, okay? So, it's very strange, in particular in the case of Bourdieu. Foucault is different because Foucault has a concept of power knowledge, but he doesn't relate that to firms and to managers, okay? He has, it's more a medical doctor, for example, you know. He has a power, okay, be in front of the person who comes to this medical doctor, but they never heard about firms, okay? And Foucault has, the theory, the, the worst of Foucault, really, is his book, Biopolitics, okay? Yeah, absolutely terrible, terrible, okay? Hey, we criticize that in the book. It's a sum of confusion and mixing everything and to explain what neoliberalism is about, okay? And the, the interpretation of neoliberalism is uh, people like Raymond Barr, they were concerned, Raymond Barr in France, they were concerned about our individual life as individuals and so on. What do we eat? How do we drink? How we, okay, uh, and so on, our private life and so on. This is a concept of biopolitics, which is not even defined in the book, okay? Absolutely nothing to do with neoliberalism, exactly the opposite. 
and if I had more time, uh, I would discuss uh, uh, Foucault's analysis of the Ancien Regime. I would discuss the uh, Louis XV, for example, in France. I would discuss the physiocrat and the analysis of the physiocrat and the economy by Foucault. Turgot, for example, how, how uh, Foucault understand or misunderstand Turgot. Uh, Turgot, but whatever, so, so this is another story. So uh, it's, it's perfectly true with Foucault and the power knowledge, with Bourdieu and the concept of, of knowledge as capital, we had the perfect basis for an understanding or the, at least an analysis of what managerial capitalism is about. But they never heard about it. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm Carmen from Option B. Thank you for your presentation. You are from where? Germany. <coughs> Germany, very good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have one question. I don't know if I missed it uh, in the presentation, but um, you were pretty much relating the class pattern to this new mode of production. Um, but I have somehow missed the part of uh, to whom the means of production belong in this new, uh, yeah, uh, just, um, or... Uh, mode, of, mode of production, this mm -hmm. new yeah, uh, sort of arrangement. And so if the managers now become to be the new capitalists... Uh, no, they are not the new capitalists, they are managers. New upper class. Okay, they mm. are the new upper class, but with their increased sources of income, which they generate via, uh, via wages, will they buy, for example, means of production? Or will they, because of financialization, buy financial assets? And then in turn become the, the shareholders of the corporations, which is owners of production, which is capitalists. Mm. So there are two aspects in your question. Yeah. Huh? Can we first take the last question and then we can mm. Yeah, the okay, question. okay. Thank you. Adga from Option B, and I'm from Indonesia. So thank you for your time once again. And uh, like many other in the class, I'm preoccupied by your graph 2.2 which shows the ratio of wage to total income for the top 1% of, uh, of the population. And uh, it comes to me as quite shocking, and I didn't expect the development that you showed in the graph. And I would love it if you could elaborate more into the interpretation of that development. And how do you, how do you find that development fits with the concept of the second financial hegemony? How did that happen despite the second, financial of the second hegemony of the financial? Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, what, what development mean? Can you repeat the uh, development? The, the, the increasing ratio of wage over total income for the top 1%. How could that happen despite financialization, perhaps, and etc. Um, okay, two last questions, Yelena, and then quickly Victoria, and then we are done. Uh, hello, my name is Victoria. I'm from Option A, and my question highly correlates with the. I don't know if the microphone is uh, working, or maybe I'm too <laughs> old. I, I can't. No, maybe I'm deaf, you know. But I'm Victoria. Uh, I'm from Option A from Russia, and I would like to ask you um, the question highly correlated to the Aga ones about um, incorporation of elites, uh, about incorporation of this, um, let's say, top one percent to the government sector, and how. Um, can we um, connect the theory of managerial capitalism to the uh, theory of managerial government state uh, or maybe technocrat technocratic democracy? Um, maybe you can comment on the um, some examples when uh, high top managers move to uh, government structures and uh, maybe they influence to the system, economic system and governmental system. Um, hello, I'm Yelena. I will be just brief, just shortly. I would like to return to the beginning of your presentation. No, no, I, I cannot hear you because it, the microphone doesn't work. It's <laughs> just for the camera, so. I'm Yelena from Option A, and I would like to return to the beginning of your presentation. When you mentioned um, socialism and that some countries had self-proclaimed socialism, and you mentioned the um, USSR example. Um, well, the, the example of what? Of USSR, of USSR, the Russia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I come from the country that was once a part of Yugoslavia and we also had a similar system but a bit different. Mm -hmm. So um, now these countries, after the, they em 
uh, were implementing the um, social, socialistic Marx and Engels ideas. Now they are implementing a part of um, managerial capitalism. Mm -hmm. So what I would just like you to briefly make a parallel for us or just answer. Do you think that considering the income distributions for some countries today in general, as we heard that for different countries they have differences in their capitalism system even, do you think that it's better that they are implementing today um, the ideas of managerial capitalism? Or maybe uh, com considering that before they were uh, up implying the socialistic ideas in the regarding the um, income distributions that we see also problems in those countries today. Thank Your you. question is: Is it bet was it better before or now? Yeah. Do you think it's better now that because we have observed, as you said, uh, still we have problems with uh, managerial capitalism and income distributions? Thank you. That would be all. These are our questions. Okay. So. I begin with the last question. I have no idea, you know. <laughs> Actually, the, this country, in the, in the book, we, we have a rather important section on uh, self-management in Yugoslavia. Okay. So was the system better? Uh, what we believe is that in Yugoslavia or in USSR, there was a course of reforms. Okay. And we are using a lot of uh, Moshe Lewin. I don't know if you know Moshe Lewin. Moshe Lewin is not, not with Yugoslavia, but he's the best uh, specialist. He was the best specialist of USSR. Okay? So he described the course of reform of why reform failed. Okay? So we believe you know, that if the reforms have succeeded more in a Gorbachev way than it what actually happened, for example, if you saw, it could have been certainly better than what is happening now. Okay? So in uh, Yugoslavia, there was also a progress of reform which fell because this country moved back to traditional, if I can say, managerial capitalism. But there was a potential. Okay? We call these countries a uh, self-programmed socialism, but we call that also uh, bureaucratic managerialism. And uh, Yugoslavia, was, well, Yugoslavia was less bureaucratic in a sense, okay? But there was a dynamic of reform for another type of society, and probably in relation to the move to neoliberalism in, within the country of Europe, this country moved to uh, a form of capitalism, of managerial capitalism, in USSR, typically manage, uh, neoliberal. In China, um, capitalist, uh, managerial, but not neoliberal. And in uh, Yugoslavia, uh, Yugoslavia, I don't know exactly. Uh, uh, it was, is it better or worse? I have no idea. But uh, probably, you know, a, a well conducted reform could have given birth to something uh, better than what's happening now. So let me now move backward. Uh, if I, uh, what was the other, the, the last bus one? Uh, you, you, your question. This was about income and the. The ratio of wage to total income. To, to the ratio of wage to total income. Uh, but what was the question? Because what. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's like this because even in the financial sector, huh, in the financial sector, you have now a new category of people who are managers in our sense, okay, although they are not the people who directly hire and dismiss people, you know, and they, they are making huge incomes, okay, they are making huge income. This income includes, of course, stock op exercise stock options. At the end of the year, at the top at least, you know, but the, 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 to, to us, you see, it, the, this graph, you know, shows that actually the, the new uh, power of uh, drawing income from society is a power which is in the end of these people as wage earners in, in, the, in a broad sense not basically as, uh, as owner of capital. And this is a link with the question that you asked, uh, which was about 
So I said, I remember that in your question, there were two aspects, you see. Um, if I remember properly, um, but I forgot the first aspect. What was it? I, I, I do identify the two aspects. I only know one. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, but. So I said that if managers uh, receive higher income streams mm -hmm. via wages and become the new leading class, mm -hmm. then uh, what, do th what do they do with this, uh, with the wealth? They will okay, buy okay, the okay. Of production or assets, so they will become capitalists in turn. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Sure. See, no doubt, you know. Of course, these people are making a lot of money with their wages, and they will make financial investment. Okay, so this is something that we analyze, which is absolutely typical of the transition between modes of production. Okay, and here we compare with uh, the, the ancien regime and so on. What, we, what is happening now? Because of the development of managerial capitalism, is a kind of mergers between upper classes. The situation now is that the upper classes are, we have a process not only of alliance in the sense of, uh, in the sense of the way I define uh, neoliberalism, but we have a kind of merger in the sense that the, at the top, the ruling, actually ruling class is a managerial capitalist class, okay? Just like in the Ancien Regime. In the Ancien Regime, you had exactly this, because large, uh, the, the former nobility was gradually transforming itself into cap a capitalist class. And the capitalist class was transforming itself into a nobility, in the sense that during those years, for example, a big capitalist family, the daughter, would marry with the son of a, a noble family. And so the process was a process of merger at the top. What was in the Ancien Regime, the ruling class? It was a kind of mixed capitalist, traditional, feudal, you know, but losing gradually the, the uh, upper class. And this is exactly what's happening now at the top of social hierarchy. You, you have this type of merger which is happening between various fractions at the top. So these people, for example, in the, the one person now, they have 80% as wages and 20% of their income as capital income. But 20% of their income in the average for the one person, this represents, this amounts to $100,000 of capital income every year <laughs> compared with 400 of wages. So in the sense, who are they socially? They are manager capitalists. If there is a merger at the top because when you, you make $100,000 of capital income every year, it's a lot, you see? So in a sense, yes, you are a capitalist. But the other uh, aspect, the other side of the coin is that you are making 400 as wage earner. Why? Because you are a big manager in a financial institution, okay? And also you are in the board of director and so on. So what is happening now is a merger. And when I speak rapidly of the alliance between capitalists and managers, I speak too fast because this alliance is supported by or is tightly linked to a process of merger at the top. And this is how the big traditional capitalist families, for example, in the US now, are transforming themselves. So in a sense, as big shareholder of corporation, the son of the family will become an important manager in this fa particular financial institution. He will sit in the but now you have to be very competent also to do that, uh, and so on. So the complexity, uh, that's the reason why, you know, I've shown in the outline of the book that the last chapter of the first part is about the transition between feudalism and capitalism. And I said this is a process of more than two centuries. Exactly, and the, I called it, you know, hybrid, an hybrid pattern. This is exactly what is happening now. We are. And this is why we wrote this chapter, because it is difficult to understand hybrid features. 
So now we are the the phrase, you know, the phrase managerial capitalism means that so you have capitalist aspect, you have managerial aspects. Yes. Uh, yeah. My, my Ah, yeah, yeah, this was the first question I mentioned. This was the first question. Of course, you know, I within managerialism, managers own the mean of production. It's strange because they own it collectively. Within capitalism, it is exactly the same thing. Capitalists now fundamentally own the means of production collectively. You can have a billionaire. Okay, in Mexico, who owns you know this part of capital? But if you consider the capitalist, the, the managerial capitalist system globally, I mean, they, these classes, managers and capitalists, own the means of production collectively. In the, it means that they make decisions. Okay, they make now through the shares, you know, they own collectively. But fundamentally, capitalist classes now. If you accept billionaires, okay, if you accept billionaire capitalist classes, give their funds to be managed by asset managers. Uh, also, the Orbis data, database shows that very clearly. They give their funds to be managed by asset manager. The, the people don't even know where the money is going because you have a set of top financial managers who make decisions and a lot of money uh, locating capital in various corporations, okay? And now, the, the, the form, you see, you have, I don't know how many forms, how many possible forms, this is the last bust one chapter of the book, of managerialism, because USSR was a managerialism. Post-war compromise, the post-war social democratic society was a managerialism, a managerial uh, capitalism, of course, you know. But now you have other forms. In the US, you have also managerial capitalism. But the, because of the alliance between and the merger between capitalists and managerial classes, you have institutions like big financial corporations, which are controlled by big managers who manage the funds of capitalists and people who are basically managers but give their funds to manage. We are in complete hybridity, exactly like in the transition, if you study the 17th or the 18th century, we are in complete hybridity, complete mix. This is what's happening now, but you have to understand that there is an historical dynamic. There is an historical dynamic, and the historical dynamic is really moving toward more managerial feature. In this sense, neoliberalism represented a setback, because in the 1970s, capitalist classes in the countries of the big country of the center were losing almost everything, and they were able to jump again in the bandwagon, okay, with neoliberalism, and we have a new uh, institutional configuration of the mix between these various groups. It's absolutely important to understand this complexity, to understand the nature of contemporary relations of production. <laughs>